Hey, it's Gabe here. I want to thank you personally for checking out our YouTube channel and I want to invite you to click the subscribe button so that each weekend's message will automatically show up in your feed so that you can check it out. With that being said, we want to jump into today's message. Welcome all of you that are here. I want to welcome those of you that are watching online and I want to make mention of a few things. A couple of these you heard about in the video announcements, but I want to mention them again and then there are a few extra things that I want to talk to you about. Uh, the first thing is grow groups. Our spring semester begins this week and we're excited about it being in community growing together. We believe in it here as a church and we believe that you need it. Whether or not you think you need it, you need it. God created you for a relationship. He created you to grow. We've been saying it in our series that we were never uh, we were never meant to be perfect, that God knows that you will never be perfect because you live in this world but he does desire for you to be making progress and for you to be growing in your relationship with others and most importantly in your relationship with God. And so uh, yourimpactchurch.com slash grow. There are still some spots available to get in a group. And so uh, it's a great way to meet people, great way to get connected and uh, grow in your faith together. And uh, we have a lot, you heard about Pink Impact just a few moments ago, but I wanna go ahead and make mention of a few other things as well as far as conferences and camps this year. This will be the first year. In the past, we have done a ladies' conference. Uh, we've done some things in-house. We've gone to Pink Impact, or the ladies have gone to Pink Impact. The men have gone to the Men's Summit. Uh, we are doing that again this year, and so you heard it March 26th and 27th. Uh, yourimpactchurch.com slash ladies. You can get registered for the Pink Impact Women's Conference. It is always a lot of fun. Uh, a, a lot of ladies go, and you guys get to hang out, really connect with each other, and there's a lot of I mean, it is quality, quality, quality stuff. And so I would encourage you to get signed up. And you heard the two different options. The two different options are based on uh, whether or not you want your own bed. Come on, somebody. And so uh, it's $175 per person uh, for those that want to be in a room where there are four ladies in a room and just kind of shave some of that cost off for you. If you want to be in a room where it's just you and one other person and you have your own bed, that cost is $230. And so you can kind of pick your pick your uh, what you want to do there and we have certain spots available for both and it is first come first serve so the sooner you can get registered the better and uh, like you heard in the announcements there are 20 tickets available uh, men the men are going to be going to men's summit may the 14th and 15th and you can go online already and you can register yourimpactchurch.com slash men and you can be a part of that it's always a great time we enjoy it and so get on there and register and we're going to go hang out have a good time and grow together uh, and then two things that we are doing that are brand new to our church, uh, heading into our, this is our fourth year as a church, and uh, we are going to have option for your kids, a kids camp, and then our students are going to be going to a student conference this year. And so uh, kids camp, it looks like the dates for kids camp, if you want your child to be able to go, is going to be May the 25th through the 29th, so right after school lets out. Uh, they're going to be going to camp, and we're going to be getting you more information. You can go online uh, on the iKids page and register or get more information there. And then the student conference is going to be July the 15th through the 17th. And yourimpactchurch.com slash youth. Go to the youth page, and you can get all the information for that and get registered for those things. And we're excited because this year all the men, come on, we get to go somewhere. The women get to go somewhere. The kids are able to uh, to, to have camp this summer. And we're excited about that. And then the youth in July go into that. And then the last thing I want to mention to you before we jump into the message today is the Belize mission trip. And the reason I want to mention it to you is because this Wednesday evening, uh, we're going to get together at 6 o'clock at Paris Coffee. And just for about 30 minutes or so, we're going to get all of those loose ends tied up. And so if you've already turned in your application uh, to go on the mission trip, then you need to be there. If you uh, have not turned in your application, but you want to go on the mission trip, you need to be there. And so this is where we're going to get all the application and stuff, make sure all that is filled out correctly and, and nail all that down. And then the, the other thing that you'll need on that day, on Wednesday evening, is you'll need, it's a $115 deposit to reserve your spot on the trip. So this does go toward the total balance, so it'll come off of the balance that's owed and, and all of that, but $115 per person we'll need so that we can submit all of that and get our team finalized and begin to organize that and uh, and all those good things. So we're excited about that. That's June the 6th through the 13th. So I would encourage you to uh, be a part of that. It's a great time. Last year, we were able to go to Jamaica, had a great time just serving God, serving people, and doing ministry there. And this year in Belize, it's going to be incredible. So 
uh, get signed up. Be there Wednesday, 6 o'clock, so that we can get all the information to you that you'll need and get all of that finalized. So, as uh, you're probably aware by now, our church uh, has, has done this every single year. We have a word for the year. And normally we do a series in January based on the word for the year. This year it's more of an extended series because there are still some parts to this that we want to, to get to. But our word for the year, come on, say it with me, progress. We are making progress. There are things that are, that are happening and progress that's being made in your life in 2020 that, that, that God is going to do in you that maybe you've been praying for for years, you just started believing God for, maybe there's something that, that you're believing God for and you know that 2020 is the year and you're just standing on it. We believe this is the year of progress uh, for our church, which then, pour, which then spills out into you as well and progress in your life. And I just want to uh, recap, and I would encourage you, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I want to get into what God wants to say today. But uh, in week one, we talked about being pruned for progress. Week two, progress requires a process. And week three, last week, was the table and the pantry. And I would encourage you to go back on the podcast, go back on uh, social media, check those messages out, and uh, get caught up to speed. I believe it will be a blessing to you. And today, in part four of our series, we're going to be talking on this subject. If you're taking notes or if you're on the Bible app, the title of the message today is Training Day. Training Day, not to be confused with the Denzel Washington movie, from several years ago, training day. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Uh, training day. And uh, we're going we're gonna to cover a lot of ground today in this message, and so I want you to hang with me. But I want to start today in this message in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, something that Paul wrote uh, to, to the Corinthians, and then we're going to get into some other scriptures. We go through the message and talk about some different things today. But this is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians Chapter 9, if you're on the, the Bible app or you can follow along on the screen behind me. He says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. In other words, take it seriously. You're running in, in, in this spiritual race. You need to take it for real. You need to be running like you are trying to win the prize. All athletes are, say this word with me, disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. Verse 26, so I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, and here's our phrase for the day, training it to do what it should. Anybody in the room today know that sometimes you have to train your body to do what it should. Anybody ever not felt like doing what you knew you should? You have to train your body to do what it should. Otherwise, otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might myself be disqualified. And so today I want to talk to you about the importance of training yourself to do what you should do. Come on, look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Everybody participate. Look at your neighbor say, it's training day. It's training day. It's training day. I think some of us need to enter into a season of training. If we're going to make progress in 2020, some of us need to enter into a season of training. Training. And so today's going to be a little bit different. Instead of focusing on just three points or something like that, I want us to talk about some disciplines and some things that I believe the Word of God teaches us that we should be doing as Christians. These are some things that you should be doing. But chances are there are going to be one or two or five on this list that you may not be doing. And sometimes in order to begin doing them, you have to, say it with me, train yourself. You have to train yourself. Some of you ladies are looking like, I've been trying to train him for about 13 years now, and it has not worked. Come on, you got to train yourself. you got to train yourself. So here is discipline Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. It's simply this, the Word of God. The Word of God. The first thing we need to talk about today is the Word of God. This is what the Bible says in Psalm 119, starting in verse 105. It says, your Word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. I've promised it once, and I'll promise it again. I will obey your righteous regulations. I have suffered much, O Lord. Restore my life again as you promised. Lord, accept my offering of praise and teach me your regulations. My life constantly hangs in the balance, but I will not stop obeying your instructions. 
The wicked have set their traps for me, but I will not turn from your commandments. Your laws are my treasure. They are my heart's delight. I am determined to keep your decrees to the very end. And I want to focus in on verse 105 for just a moment. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. How many of us in the room today, anybody got kids? Come on, he got kids. Where are all my parents at? You got kids, you got kids. You ever walked into your kid's room at night when it's dark and all of a sudden you step on something in the form of a Lego or you round the corner only for your brain to forget how close the bed was to the door and you stub your toe or you hit your shin on the end of the bed or on some bunk bed, or you walk into something that you were not anticipating to be there. Come on, anybody ever experience the pain? There is no other pain like the pain of walking into a bed or stepping on a Lego in the middle of the night when you are barefoot walking around your house. And my question is, why do those things happen? And here's what I think the answer is. It's because you were avoiding turning on the light hang with me because i'm going somewhere (laughs) the reason you walked into that bed and the reason you stepped on that lego is because you were avoiding and you had good cause right kids are asleep just going in there to make sure that they're okay before we go to bed and i don't want to turn the light on because if i turn the light on i might wake them up i'm avoiding turning on the light can i submit to you today That in Psalm 119, when it was written that your word is a lamp, it guides me, it helps me to see, could it be possible that some of us are stumbling through life because we are avoiding turning on the light? We are avoiding turning on the light. And here's what it sounds like a lot of times when we avoid turning on the light. Well, you know, I've overslept today. Ah, you know, I've tried to read the Bible before. I just don't really understand it. Ah, I just don't really have time. Oh, I was going to do it when I got to work. And then things just got crazy right off the bat. I just didn't have time to do it. Oh, I was going to do it at night before I went to bed. I was just so tired because I stayed up watching that show for three hours because I was three episodes behind. And it was just, oh, it was just, I was just, I was, I was going to, I was going to, I was going to, I was going to. I just don't get it. I don't see the importance. I, we're avoiding turning on the light. And so a lot of us are walking through life, stumbling over things, stubbing our toe, getting mad at God. Come on, somebody. Why did you put that bed there, God? Well, if you had turned on the light, I could have shown you where it was before you got here. So I don't know why you're mad at me. It was your fault. Some of it, we we, we got to turn on the light. I wonder how many of us at church today have been avoiding this. And it's not because the light isn't there. It's not that the electricity has been turned off on you. God's still there. His word is still there. The lamp is still there. Nothing has been turned off. When Think about when a house is built, the light switch is put where? Close to the door. Why is it put close to the door and not across the room? So that you don't have to walk across the room in the dark before you can turn on the light. Come on, somebody. God has given you something close to the door that if you'll turn it on and you'll pick it up and you'll open it up and you'll begin to say, God, speak to me through your word. I need to read something today that I can walk in the room and flip the light on. And I won't be stumbling all over the place because I can actually see because his word is a lamp is a light for my path some of us we just refuse to turn on the light we've got all the excuses but psalm 119 it tells us that god's word is a lamp to guide our feet and a light for our path we even see the word of god talking about this discipline in our lives we see jesus using the word of god to overcome the enemy in luke chapter 4 This is what the Bible says. Then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus, and you got to know, Jesus has just been fasting for 40 days. Come on, some of y'all were fasting for 21 days, and you're like, thank God. I am so excited for what God did, but I am so excited to eat a burger. Right? Jesus has been fasting 
for 40 days. And the devil says, hey, if you're the son of God, just turn this stone into some bread so that you can eat. I know you're hungry. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said. Like, which it just cracks me up because, you know, it's like here's the, the devil talking to Jesus who is, you know, about to get all the authority. And, and it's like, well, I'll give you all this stuff, you know, if you'll, if you'll do this. And Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. See, three times the enemy came to Jesus and tempted him, trying to get him to give in, you know, just, ah, just, just get off just a little bit, just come over here just a little bit, just worship me, I know you're hungry, just turn this into bread, let me get you to do something that you know you shouldn't do, but let me just tempt you, and three times, Jesus overcame the temptation with what? The word of God, and then it goes on in verse 13, and I love this verse, when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, the devil's like, well, I'm not going to get this guy right now, and so it says, he left him until the next opportunity came. I came to tell somebody today that the temptation you've been facing even when you overcome it, the enemy is just waiting for the next opportunity to come at you again with something else. To come at you again when you're in a weak state, when you have, when you have uh, isolated yourself. This is why groups are so important. You need to get out of isolation. You need to get around some people, five, six, 12 people that are studying the word of God and going somewhere that you want to be going so that you can get in relationship with people and you can get in community with people and you can grow and you can better understand what God's plan is for your life. It's why it's so important. The enemy is always looking for the next opportunity to come at you. He was doing that with Jesus also. He wants to get at you and get you to give in and my question to you today is when the enemy comes and tempts you, do you have the word of God in your heart to speak to overcome the temptation? Or do you have a tendency to give in because you don't know how to fight back? See, discipline number one, you need the word of God in you. This is what in Psalm 119, another verse, verse 11, says, I have hidden your word in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. I have hidden your word inside of my heart. So that when temptation comes and I feel like doing the wrong thing, no, I got something inside of me that I can speak over this situation so that I will not say, I have hidden your word in my heart. This is how you overcome. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Some of us, listen. When you read the Bible, the Bible reads you. When you get into the word, it starts to get into you. And it says right here that it, you, some of us are wondering, we're like, why do I keep doing that thing? Why do I keep doing that thing? Listen, listen, the word of God is alive and powerful. It cuts between soul and spirit. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Listen, some of you, the reason you keep going back to what you're going back to is because you have not made the decision to get in the word on a consistent basis so that it's in your heart and you keep wondering, why do I keep doing that? Listen, the word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts between so what you want to do and what the spirit living inside of you wants you to do. It's the word of God. Some of us are trying to walk through life with no light, no ammo, nothing to fight back with, nothing to overcome with, nothing to quote back at the enemy, we're trying to walk through life without the thing that exposes all of the stuff in our life that keeps us from walking back into what we've been in before. You need the word of God. And I was thinking about it this way, and really each one of these things that you and I, we need to train ourselves to read and study the word of God. Come on, some of us, some of us, we need, it's training day. Some of us, we need to get down every single day 
and I may not feel like but I know that I need it. And sometimes it hurts because I don't want to get up 30 minutes earlier to get in the word, but I know that it's powerful. And I know that it's what I need in my life. And I know that when the enemy tries to come against me today, the only way I'm going to be able to overcome is by the word of God. So I'm going to train myself. Come on, somebody say train. I'm going to train myself to do what I know I should do. You can't wait until you feel like it. Some of us made New Year's resolutions to get in the gym, but you haven't been yet because you don't feel like it. You can't wait until you feel like it. The enemy will always keep you from feeling like it. If I can just make them, if I can just keep them in this place where they don't feel like it, they'll never do it. They'll never go. So discipline one, the word of God. Here's discipline number two. It's prayer. The second thing that we need to talk about today is prayer. First Thessalonians 5.17 says this, never stop praying. How are you doing with that? Never stop praying. It's it's this, it's this state of continually being in a mindset of prayer, that prayer is the first thing. When something happens, prayer is the first place that you go. That I'm going to be in this constant mindset and attitude of prayer. Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room. Right, there's Pastor Saul, you can't, pray to, you can't pray to your God anymore. You can't pray to your God. He, he hears this news, and he's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go home and pray. I'm going to go home and pray. With its windows open toward Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. Daniel was consistent to pray multiple times every single day. In Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, one day soon after Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Listen to me. Jesus went and prayed all night before he made a big, big decision. Some of us just decide things without ever involving God in the process. And Jesus went away and prayed all night long so that he could make the right decision. Big decision. Got to pick 12. I know this is what God, the Father, is calling me to do. And so I got to go away and pray all night so that I can get it right. It's prayer. Jesus prayed before making a decision. Before you buy that thing, pray. Before you go there, pray. Before you say that, pray. Before you get married, pray. Before you take that new job, pray. Before you discipline that child, pray. We have lost the art of just taking a moment and praying and inviting God into the situation. And some of us are trying to make progress in our own strength. And God says, I'm right here. I'm right here. If you'll just take some time and pray. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 7, says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks the door will be open. You parents, if, you, if your children ask you for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who It's prayer. It's asking. It's talking to God. Prayer is effective. I've already heard a few different testimonies, people that text or people that have called, uh, of things that happened in people's lives as we came out of this 21 days of prayer. People that were seeking after God, believing God for something, and, and they would, you'll never, this, this happened. You'll never guess what happened. You'll never guess what happened. I bet I know what happened. I bet God did something. I bet God came through. 
because we took the time to pray. We took the time to pray. When Jesus prayed before making decisions, and prayer is important enough for Daniel to make time for it three times a day, and we believe that prayer is effective according to Jesus, then why do we not pray? Is the enemy going to fight to keep you from praying? Absolutely. Is focusing to pray difficult sometimes? You betcha. Will there be days when you don't know what to pray? Yes. But what do you do? You pray. You just talk to God. You talk to God. Just some practical things. I'm talking about training ourselves, and I was thinking about this, and it could be just setting a reminder in your phone. Take a moment and pray. Come on, we're talking about training. Sometimes you got to do some things you're like, really? I'm going to set a reminder on my phone to pray? That's not very spiritual. That's more spiritual than what you've been doing. <laughs> I'm going to get back here for a minute. I'm going to set a reminder on my phone. I'm going to download an app that, like, saves prayer. Li- yeah. Because you are training yourself to pray, to do what you know you should do, even when you don't feel like doing it. So we got the word of God, we got prayer, we got a couple more to get to. Here's discipline number three, it's worship. And I want you to check this out in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I want to read about, about 11 verses and then talk about it for just a moment. It says, as all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children, the spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mattaniah. There's some names for your kids right there. A Levite who was a descendant of Asaph. He said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army singing to the Lord and praising him with his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to to start fighting among themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. Now I want you to picture this for a moment. He goes to get the army ready. We're going into battle tomorrow. Here we go. You know, and like, what do we need to do? We're ready. He's like, here's what you need to do. I want you on tenor and you on alto and you're soprano. What? Yeah, get warmed up. Uh, <laughs> keep going. Uh, uh, that's good. Yeah, keep keep warming up. This is keep warming up. We're going into battle tomorrow. It's like, okay. You know? And the Bible says they go into the battle and they're on their way there. And he says, listen, here's what I want you to do. I want all the worshipers. I want all the worshipers up front before anybody goes into battle. All the worshipers get in front and you're going to lead the way. And the Bible says they start singing. And when they start singing praise to God, all of the enemies, two of them gang up on the other one. And once they've killed all of them, then they turn on themselves. 
And you got to imagine how this went. Like what somebody, you know, somebody started talking about somebody's mama or something. I don't know what the Lord, I don't know how the Lord did it. <laughs> but they start singing. It's like, what'd you say? Did you hear what they said? Let's just turn on them. And then they turn on each other. And it says by the time they get there, they show up and they look around. They're like, everybody dead. I guess this thing works, you know. Before the next battle, let's just warm up again. Oh, got a little more confidence this time. We know who's going first, the worshipers. It's, a, it's the discipline of worship. And see, here's some of us, we love to sing the song that we sing here at church sometimes that this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. But some of us look like this. This is how I fight my This is how I fight my battle. We trust God for a moment, and then when God doesn't do it in our timing, or things don't look like they're going to happen the way that we thought they would, we're like, you know, God, I was going to lay it at your feet, but maybe you're busy right now, so I'm going to pick it back up. No. Worship. Worship. Get up in the morning. Take time every single day to put on a worship song make the decision come on some of us we just need to we need to train ourselves you know we're just gonna get up in the morning and I know I feel like worrying but instead of worrying I'm gonna worship instead of fretting about what's gonna come on to come on I'm just training myself I'm just getting in shape today because I know that some things are gonna happen today and I'm gonna need to get my worship on before I go to work today because I know something might happen, and instead of worrying about it, I'm going to worship about it. Come on, I'm training myself to worship. See, some of us, we're just waiting for this to happen. You go to bed at night, and you're like, worship tomorrow. Mm. Alarm goes off at 6 o'clock, and you're like, snooze. 610, one more time. You gotta train yourself. Paul said, I train my body to do what it should do. I train it. I train it. Here's discipline number four. It's silence. Silence. First Kings 19 says, Go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing? us a sign and tell us what we're doing right and work everything out in our favor and give us the new job and we're waiting for God to do a miracle in our lives and God is standing next to you inside of you and he's whispering and some of us won't get quiet enough to be able to hear what God is trying to say Some of us will not turn the noise off in our life long enough to be able to hear. God, I thought you were close. I thought you were close. I thought you were close. Yeah, I'm close enough that I can talk to you like this. And if you'll get quiet, you can hear what I'm saying. You've got to train yourself to be silent, to be silent. And discipline number five as the worship team comes back. We talked about the word of God, and prayer, and worship, and silence. Number five is this, thankfulness. Thankfulness. You have to train, oh, you know I'm telling you the truth. You have to train yourself to be thankful. 
Oh, you can find something to complain about. Oh, you can find something that's not going your way. You can get up in the morning and dread the day before it ever even starts, but you've got to train yourself to be thankful. First Thessalonians 5.18, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. God, I just want to know your will. God, I just want to know your will. What is it that you desire for me? Here's what God desires for you, that you would be thankful in all circumstances, that you would find something to be thankful for. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. And I read this a couple of weeks ago, and I want to share it with you today on this idea or this discipline of being thankful. It says, thankfulness is such an underrated spiritual discipline. Being thankful forces you to stop in the midst of your doing, reflect on the movements of God in your life, be conscious of them, and express your appreciation for them to God. Being thankful keeps you humble. It is a conscious acknowledgement that God has been at work and that we need him. A thankful heart is a heart that is rooted in the reality of God's goodness and presence. Will you stand to your feet today? When was the last time that you remembered being more thankful for God in your life than you were actually focused on the things that were not going your way in your life? When was the last time in the middle of, of something happening in your life, losing a job, losing a relationship, that something's not going your way? When was the last time in that moment you found something to be thankful for? See, the word of God says that we, we, that we come to him with thankfulness. With thankfulness. With thankfulness. And I believe what I read, that, that thankfulness is this spiritual discipline that is so underrated. Because many of us, we go to the Lord and pray. And there's nothing wrong. You need to tell God what you need. Tell God what's on your heart. God wants to hear all of that stuff from you. But you, what if you went to God first? And the first thing out of your mouth was how thankful you are. I know that that hasn't turned out like I thought it would. But God, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for what you've given me. I'm so thankful for this house. I'm so thankful for these kids. I'm so thankful for this job. And I know I don't always like going and things don't seem to be going my way. And, and, and sometimes it's hard and I don't quite get it. But oh, but God, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that you sent Jesus to die for me. I'm so thankful that I can have eternal life. I'm so thankful that when I die one day or when Jesus comes back, that I'm going to be able to go and be in heaven and I'm going to be with him forever. I'm just so thankful. When was the last time that you just got on your knees? Because you were thankful. Because you were so grateful for everything that you have that you don't even deserve. You'll always be able to find something that you don't like, that you can complain about, that didn't happen the way that you thought it would happen. But I believe God sent me here today, if you don't hear anything else, to remind you that you and I we have so much to be thankful for. So much to be thankful for. I want to read this verse to you and then we're going to pray. Sing a song before we leave today. But I was thinking about David in the Bible when he went out to face Goliath. Most of us in this room have heard 
the story of David and Goliath. But in 1 Samuel 17, verse 36, this is what he says. Before he goes out, he says, I've done this to both lions and bears. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. What, what was David saying? Here's what I believe David was saying. Do we have that? Can you put that on the screen? I've done the things I needed to do when no one was watching. And it has prepared me for this moment. What was David saying? I've been faithful in the stuff when you didn't see me. And because I've done the stuff in secret that I needed to do and I've trained myself, now I'm ready for this moment. So Gabe, what is this, what is this whole, what is this whole message about? What's this right here? Progress is made in private. Progress is made in private. Progress is made in private. What you do in private prepares you for what God wants to do in public. But you've got to be willing to say, it's training day. And I may not be where I want to be yet, but I know what I should be doing. And I'm going to start, I'm going to start training myself to be in the I'm going to train myself to pray. I'm going to train myself to worship. I'm going to train myself to be silent so that I can hear him whisper. I'm going to train myself to be thankful even when I have a hundred things on my list that I want to complain about. I'm going to train myself. It's training day. It's training day. Progress is made in private. So God, we thank you today. I'll invite the prayer team to come down. God, would you do something today in our private lives? Not in public. Not what everybody sees. But God, knowing that what, what, what you do in us in private is what prepares us for what you want to do in front of everybody. And just like David said, <laughs> I've been faithful when nobody was watching. And I've done things that nobody knows that I've done. And that's the reason why I can stand here today and say, I'm prepared for this moment. I'm prepared for what you want to do. God, would you remind us today, would you, would you teach us today that progress is made in private? And Lord, today, if, if there's anybody here who needs prayer for anything in their life, Lord, I pray as, as the worship team begins to sing this last song, God, that we would step out of our seat that we would come and let somebody agree with us in prayer. And Lord, today, that you would do something and that you would change what's going on in our private lives because progress is made in private. So as we sing this song, Holy Spirit, I pray you would draw every person today who needs prayer in Jesus' name.